Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. We're going to be in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. And I just want to say thank you for uh, going on this journey through the book of Acts. When I first started it, I didn't realize, you know, it's 28 chapters long. <laughs> I should have known that, you know. And uh, so, but I'm grateful that you, you've st stuck with me here on this. We've been learning a lot, haven't we? And we've been learning how Christianity began and how it continues to change the world, how it did then, how it does now. And um, I just want to say, uh, I hope you've been blessed by our journey here. Today's message is entitled, Friends in High Places. And all, we all know that we have God. He's our friend. And he is in the highest place, but he's also very close to us. And I was reminded in Psalm 121 yesterday, as I was reviewing and praying for today, it says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. We look up to God, but we also find that he is very near through the Holy Spirit. If you're going through something today, just know you have a friend who's not only in a high place, but he's also living with you through the Holy Spirit. And he's here for you today. We're gonna see that the Apostle Paul is promised of God's help, his protection, his provision. Something he didn't necessarily have. Uh, he's always had God, he's always had provision and whatnot. But in previous chapters, we see that he was beaten. In this chapter, we see that God protects him and he actually gives him a revelation, a promise that he would do that. And I want to see what we can take from Acts chapter 18 and apply it to our lives. There's, some, there's different things here and there. But I just want to let you know that this chapter is one of those ones that fills in some, that connects some dots and fills in some blanks here and there. A lot of different things happen. And so I really had to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, help, you know, show me how we can apply this this week. And I just pray that that the Lord applies things even that I didn't think of or that I took from it that you can apply to your life. Amen. I have been hearing many of you say, you've come to me after service or you've messaged me and you said, I know you didn't teach this, but I took this from it and it really blessed me. And that is something I've been praying for. And it's good to hear that you are receiving the word and the Holy Spirit is helping you apply. All right, let's go to chapter 18, verse 1. We're not sure why, but the Apostle Paul uh, left Athens and went to Corinth by himself. And uh, we're not too sure why. Uh, he's always done everything with a team, with a group of people. We do know this, that he left Athens a little discouraged because in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, uh, it says that he uh, approached Corinth with, uh, in weakness, with great fear and trembling. So he, he came from Athens where he was a little discouraged by the reception of the people. And now he's going to Corinth. Now Corinth was a very popular city. Uh, this is where we get our letters from Paul, first and second Corinthians. They believe that he actually wrote four letters to the church of Corinthians or the church of Corinth, but we've lost two of the letters. We don't have two of those letters. Um, who knows, maybe it was in the future shipwreck that Paul was on. Maybe he lost them there. We're not sure. All we know is that Corinth was actually uh, such a wicked place, especially in moral, sexually immoral place, that they said, if, if you go to Corinth, you'll be Corinthicized. And so Paul is going into this kind of place, weak in fear and trembling, and I think that's why God shows up and speaks to him to encourage him. But we, we've seen in the past a couple of chapters how this mob keeps following him and tries to fight against him. Well, we're going to see some resistance here as well. All right, let's read uh, verse one. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, 
just as he was. History says in AD 49, the emperor Claudius actually removed all the Jews from Rome and they believe, and I'm gonna quote what I have here from a scholar, the trouble was over the teaching of Christus or Christus, and in Latin that means Christ. So the teaching of Jesus had um, caused so much issues in Rome that they expelled all the Jews out of Rome at this point. And so it's most likely that Aquila and Priscilla are here because of that reason. And they most likely converted to Christianity through the preaching of a Roman Christian Jew that was at Acts 2 at the day of Pentecost. How cool was that? So you remember Acts 2 when all these people came together for Passover and the Holy Spirit came upon them, filled them with the Holy Spirit. Peter comes out of the house, the room, he preaches. That sermon has now, has now reached Aquila and Priscilla. How powerful is that? Wow, you just never know. And Paul finds something he really needs. He finds community. Alone in Athens, he finds two people. A dynamic duo, a married couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And they are tent makers. And in the Greek, it also means leather workers. So the tents were made from leather as well. And so when Paul didn't have enough money to do ministry, he would make tents and he would work with leather. And so he found a common bond with Priscilla and Aquila. They also worked with tents. So they became really close friends in Corinth. And let's go to verse four. It says, each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. I'm gonna stop there for a moment. The reason why he only preached on the Sabbath is because he was building tents the rest of the week. But when Paul and Silas came from Philippi, they brought a gift from the church, a financial gift, which enabled Paul to not have to work for his living in this, at this time and instead live off that gift from the church and be a full-time missionary. How cool is that? And I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for giving to me. Thank you for giving to our pastors so we could dedicate our time to being full-time into ministry. If we had to, we would take up second jobs because if you're called, it doesn't matter. You'll still work and do ministry, amen? And so I just want to say thank you for being like the Church of Philippi who helps support our pastors and our, and our team here and our ministry. It means a lot to us. And for that reason, I can dedicate my time being a minister of the gospel. So he's preaching all of his time to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. The same thing he did in the previous chapters. Verse six says, but when they opposed and insulted him, they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Oh, man, that's strong words, isn't it? This was a statement, though. I can no longer spend my time trying to convince you of Jesus as the Messiah. I must move on. It was a statement that not as a rejection of them, so to say, but a strong conviction that I will move on to people who are more likely to listen to me. Your ears are closed. I must go somewhere else. This had to be difficult for Paul. He's a persistent, compassionate, and hopeful apostle. But even Paul had to be reminded that sometimes not everyone's going to believe in Jesus Christ. And there comes a time when many loving attempts won't change the minds of closed-minded people. Just to apply to us today, there comes a time where you realize you can try and try and try, but you you won't get through. Even worse though, in this situation, he was being mocked and abused and insulted. So at this point, it was worse than just, you know, a loved one that isn't really wanting to listen to you. It was that he was being insulted and mocked and opposed. And Jesus actually talks about this. You know, Jesus is a loving, he's, he's the, the loving, the greatest example of love, right? And the most loving person we know. 
But do you know that Jesus also said something about if people are going to mock you and insult you, you must wash your hands, so to say? He actually says this, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. And that's, that, that kind of blows my mind because obviously Jesus came to us, but he's talking about those who, who are rejecting him or rejecting the gospel so much that they're mocking and saw you. He says, don't throw your pearls to pigs. You know how pigs are. They walk all over in the pigsty. They wouldn't care if it's a pearl. Now, if, if, if it was a cheese ball, they would eat it, right? <laughs> they would trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. This is what Paul was dealing with. And Jesus was warning his, his disciples at that time. Paul wasn't there. But this is of the Sermon on the Mount. And there will be times, and I just want to say, as a pastor, I've experienced this. Maybe you've experienced this. And you know what? There comes a point where you just have to wash your hands and say, hey, obviously this person's not ready. They're now insulting me for my faith. They're mocking me. They're yelling in my face, whatever it may be. I must wash my hands and go to someone who's going to hear me out. Amen? With this thought in mind, we pray for them. I never give up on anyone. I continue to pray for people. And I pray that any seed I did throw will be watered by the Holy Spirit and that they will turn to him at some point in time later. And let me tell you what's been happening recently is that God is humbling people to the point of tears and it's almost like their tears are watering those seeds. We all know it's not their tears, but it's the circumstances they're going through the Holy Spirit is using to soften their hearts so that that seed will sink in. I'm seeing this happen. So we don't fully give up on people. What he did was he washed his hands and he gave them to God. And so we do the same thing. Amen. Amen. Let's keep going in, in verse 7. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justice, a Gentile who worshiped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Well, that's not going to go well. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. So it went well for the ministry, right? And, and great fruit came out of this. He, he goes to Titius Justice, a person who lives right next to the Jewish synagogue, and he uses his house to open a church ministry, a gospel ministry. The synagogue ruler gives his life to Jesus along with his entire household, meaning any servants, any family, any friends nearby, they gave their life to Christ and they were baptized uh, in water and they're believers. How powerful is that? Now I say what I say because I said earlier that that is not going to go well. That's going to brew up some controversy with the Jewish synagogue, isn't it? It's, it's beautiful, like you just how God works out his will and how God does ministry through Paul. It's amazing. And it goes here to say, uh, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. In other words, many people are going to believe and follow me. Now, remember, he was beaten with rods recently in previous chapters. God allowed him to go through that. In this city, he's saying, preach boldly. Don't, don't let up. Go all in. I'm going to protect you from harm. And many people are going to believe. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Church, I just want to just highlight something here. One night it says the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. That's Jesus. Jesus showed himself to Paul in a vision, most likely a dream, and said, do not be afraid. So there may have been a hint of fear there still. Maybe there was already tensions with the synagogue next door. He says, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack and harm you for many people in the city belong to me. That message fueled him to stay there for 18 months at least. 
And that's why we have so many letters to the church of Corinth. Verse 12 says this, but when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul. Here we go, the usual, the MO. And brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. This was a strategic move on these people. He was recently just appointed as governor. They figured they can use him to come against Paul and this church right next door. But just as verse 14 says, but just as Paul started to make the defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it's merely a question of words and names in your Jewish law, take care of it yourselves. <laughs> I refuse to judge such matters. And he threw them out of the courtroom. Friends in high places. God is sovereign. God is providential. Let me read this last verse. It says this, verse 17, the crowd then grabbed Sothenes, the leader of the synagogue. So now they have a new leader because Crispus became a Christian. He couldn't, he couldn't run the synagogue and beat him right there in the courtroom. But Gallio paid no attention. So the Jews that all went to the governor with Sosthenes, the leader, they beat him. They attacked their own leader because they were disappointed in how that went down. God is providential. This, what that means is God cares, God prepares, and he provides for his people now and in the future. He's working out his will and his plans he works in the middle of things, helping and intervening and all those things. He is always working on Paul's behalf. He promised him that they would not harm him. He appointed, I believe, that God appointed Gallio because God can also work through those who are not believers. Do you know that? Paul did not waste his protection. Paul preached bravely for 18 months. We live in that landscape today. Currently, we live in a landscape where we can, in a country, where we can preach publicly. We can speak publicly about our faith in our homes, in our workplaces in certain ways. We can do that, can't we? I wanna encourage us to not let that be wasted to use the appointed freedom that we have at this point in time in our, in our world, in our country, to be bold about our faith and to love people enough to tell them about Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else very significant here. Notice who attacked Sosthenes or Sosthenes. Notice who attacked him, his own people. It wasn't a group of angry Christians seeking revenge for Paul. It was his own circle. And what you may not know is biblical historians believe this Sosthenes wasn't just brutally beaten, but deeply impacted by this event. You know why? In 1 Corinthians chapter one, Paul writes, to the, writes the letter to the church and also mentions from me and Sosthenes. In other words, historians believe that he gave his life to Christ after this event. Because he saw that Paul did not retaliate, his own people retaliated. He was deeply impacted by the love of a man who was persecuting, being persecuted, falsely accused. He was deeply impacted so much that he eventually gives his life to Christ. And historians believe it's him because there wouldn't be anyone else that they would know about except for this one. So now another synagogue ruler becomes a believer all because of how he was treated by his own people, but how he was, the way he wasn't treated by the Christians, he was treated with love instead. Isn't that powerful? So again, I said this a couple weeks ago, may we be careful how we handle our persecution because people are watching and will notice our grace and our love, amen? 
the eyes of many are opening. Many people in our country and around the world are seeing the severity of immorality, the denigration of sacred and holy things. And they're noticing God's word has spoken accurately. People are waking up, in other words, aren't they? People that have not been dedicated to the Lord, who are not followers of Jesus Christ, who haven't read their Bibles a lot, but they do know this, that what the Bible has been talking about for centuries or millennia is coming true. Their eyes are opening to the fact and to the truth of scripture. In church, I would say this, we must be ready to lovingly help them, to lovingly be there for them. I see God is handing people to us on a silver platter. And the church must be ready to come alongside them and help them and disciple them, amen? I can't stress that enough. Imagine if a hundred people come to the Lord because of some event in our world or because of God is bringing those people in, would we be ready to take care of them and help them understand the scriptures? I bring that up because in our next portion of scripture, that's what Priscilla and Aquila do. Verse 18 says, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Centria. There he shaved his head according to Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. What in the world is that? He's just shaving his head. What he grew his hair out. They believe he took a Nazarite vow and there's differences and um, theories on why. I land on the, on the side with other Bible teachers that he took a vow that he would give his all to God after that vision that he had from Jesus. That he took a vow that he would not shave his head and that he would, and he wouldn't cut his hair and that he would do all he could to preach the gospel to Corinth. And when he left, he decided to shave his head and say, that vow is done. I did what I'm supposed to do. Now I'll move on to the next place. Now, not only do you shave your head, but you also have to go to Jerusalem and do a sacrifice. And so we'll see here in a moment that Paul wants to hurry up through Ephesus and go back to Jerusalem so he can do that sacrifice. These are things that you don't see in scripture uh, in front of you, but as you read commentaries and other study books, it helps you understand the context of the scripture. Verse 19 says, they stopped first at the port of Ephesus where Paul left the others behind. While he was there, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews, the different city, and they asked him to stay longer, but he declined. As he left, however, he said, I will come back later, God willing. Then he set sail from Ephesus. The next stop was at the port of Caesarea. From there, he went up and visited the church at Jerusalem and then went back to Antioch. So second missionary journey, done. He finished his second journey. He did the Nazarite vow. He's in Jerusalem. Then he goes back to Antioch. Verse 23 is a quick summary of his next journey. You ready for this? It says, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. That's what Luke gave us right there. Just that little snippet of his third journey. While he was doing that, Verse 24 says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria was a place of learning. So this man was brilliant. He was smart. He was studied. He had been taught the way of the Lord and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. Isn't that interesting? He did not know about the baptism of Jesus Christ. So he must have learned from someone who didn't see the whole story of Christ unfold. When verse 26 says, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in his synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. All historians agree in this moment here in the Greek that Priscilla was the lead teacher of this dynamic duo. 
She knew her stuff. She knew her word, but they worked together as a, as a team. How, how cool is that to have a husband and wife duo that can teach the word to people? I want to encourage that. Singles, I want to encourage you to know your word. Be prepared in season, in and out of season. Because when they heard him preaching boldly, they were like, wow, he is, he's, really got, he's really got a lot of great points, but he's missing something. They didn't correct him in public. They pulled him aside. And they discipled him on the side. And so we're going to find that some people are growing in the Lord outside of church, but they need a little guidance when they come inside the church too, because they need more teaching. Amen. And God wants to use you to do that as well. Verse 27 says, Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia and brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be, one of, to be of great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. This is somewhere where Paul recently was, and he was, Paul was dealing with the frustration of those people. But Paul also had fruit there. But verse 28 says this, he refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. So apparently, Priscilla and Aquila helped him understand the journey of Jesus and how he is the Messiah. God used Apollos powerfully and he used a couple that had discipled him powerfully as well. I want to help land the plane here today and, and just share some things for us to consider. Number one, when we look at this story today, I'm reminded of the need of biblical community in our lives. Paul needed Priscilla and Aquila. Apollos needed Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila needed Paul. We need each other. This year, I want to encourage you to find or foster Christian community in your life. You know the, the scripture, iron sharpens iron, amen? We want to be sharp, not dull. They were sharp, they sharpened Apollos. They made his teaching even sharper and more accurate. We also just need people there to care for us. Look at, look at Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Here's, here's what it says, and I'll need it on the screen myself. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Now, this next verse, whenever I preach this to the teens, I had to say, uh, only marry couples. <laughs> Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Or maybe the military knows about this too, in the trenches or in training. But it's serious, it's true. The point of that verse is that there's warmth, that there's help so that someone didn't freeze to death out in nature, out in survival. How can one be made warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. That is the story we just read. Paul, Priscilla, Aquila, for 18 months planted a church they believe, historians believe, that Priscilla was a powerful teacher and preacher of the word in her church. In fact, the church was in Priscilla and Aquila's home. We need each other, church. We either need to find it, or if we struggle to find it, we need to create it or foster it. And we do our part here at Calvary. We're trying to. It, obviously, this is a large church, so the opportunity for more and more groups is huge. But our community groups are getting ready to launch again here in September, second week of September, September 11th, or even before or after. And I just want to encourage you to either be a part of community with other believers, even if it's not even something that's on our website, but you create with another couple here or another single or a family, that you get together and you begin to pray for each other, read scripture together, eat together, just do life together. Amen. Amen. We sharpen each other. We help each other. Look at Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. I know that life can be really busy, but the word of God is really clear on this. 
It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That means you need to be together. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. This is not a time to be away from each other or to skip church or to skip doing life with other people or skip prayer with a brother or sister in Christ. This is not the time to do that. Right now is the time to be together. Can I get an amen? amen? How will someone motivate me towards love and good deeds if I'm not around them? And I realize there are personalities involved in this. I like my alone time too. Trust me. I need my social battery to charge as well. And I also know that there's been hurt and pain in relationships and so on and so on. I get all that. But all we know is the promise in scripture is we will be blessed when we're together. And it's, it's messy. Biblical community gets messy sometimes. But thank God that the word of God guides us on how to clean up that mess. Secondly, from the scripture, I think we need to know what we believe and why it's believable. Or the other way of putting that is know what you believe and why you believe it. But I like this way of putting it. Know what you believe and know it's believable. In other words, you yourself need to know what you believe, the Christian teachings, and be confident in it that it's truth. It is believable. I know there's a lot of naysayers out there and all those things. And I, and I, and I know that, um, that our phones are spying on us. <laughs> Anyone else get apologetics ads all week after last week's sermon? Um, I think that this is more maybe not the AI spying on me, but two days after my sermon, I get an email from Right Now Media. This is a free, let me show you this screen. This is a free resource we provide at our church. Okay, and I wanna encourage you to utilize this. But look at these two, I actually got this for you. Look at these two screenshots of what I got. Uh, after church on Sunday in my email, uh, can I trust the Bible? An apologetic topic. Okay. And then the next screen is, this is the same email. And then does Christianity still make sense? Urban apologetics and reopening Christianity. This is all apologetics topics that are being offered on right now media right now. So apologetics is defending of the faith, but it's also arguing for the faith, not in a mean way, but in a loving way. And I just want to encourage you as a church to know the basics of what you believe and why you believe it, because it is believable. Because you would be shocked at how many people just need a little bit of evidence to be open more to seeking God. When I go into our local high school and talk about it, actually, I got to talk to a mother today. Um, if permission to share, there is a mother here whose student was at CR when I went into the world religions class and he was deeply impacted by the time that I, uh, fr from the time that I was in there sharing my faith. And it's one of the reasons why they are actually here today in our church. God works in powerful ways. And I just want to encourage you that um, in, the, in the marketplace, uh, just so you know, anyone who's not a Christian, uh, many of them could be studying for themselves in a positive way, like looking into faith and they might need a little guidance. So if we can meet them where they are by studying why we believe in what we believe, I would encourage you to do that. We invest in Right Now Media as a resource to you free. You don't have to pay for that as a subscription so that you can be developed. And there's many topics on that. And it's on our website under resources. So I wanna encourage you to utilize that and know why you believe and why it's believable. And lastly, we see here, we see here that people reasoned in love, and may love be a reason they believe. Reason with people in love. And may love be a reason they believe. Listen, there's a time for a good debate and good argument about the faith. That's what apologists do. They're trained to do it. They do it with humility and grace. I notice that when I go into a local school, and do this, you have to be careful how you handle yourself. You don't wanna come across arrogant or mean. Some need reasoning and convincing arguments and some need kindness. These two are not mutually exclusive though. You can do both at the same time. 
But some people are moved by our kindness more than they're moved by our arguments. In fact, William Barclay said it well. More people have been brought into the church or the kingdom of God by the kindness of real Christian love than by all the theological arguments in the world. But I will also say that I'm watching people be challenged in what they believe in. Unbelievers, seekers, non-Christians. And that challenging is helping them consider the truths of Jesus Christ. So we need, it's a both and world here. We must do it in love and we must be willing to help people understand. So today I'm just asking us to continue to learn and be students of the word of God. To know what you believe, know it's believable and help other people believe with our love and with our teaching of the scriptures. Amen. Let me stand together as we close. If you can stand. I remember that. I try to remember that. In prayer for today, I felt prompted to just take a moment to pray for anyone who needs a friend like God. He's close. He's a close friend. He's here for you. I believe that Jesus reassures us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That God cares about you and what you're going through. God cares about protecting you, providing for you, for now and the future. In other words, God loves you. We don't know why some things happen to us as people. We don't know God's plan. He is sovereign. He's in charge. He knows what he's doing. But we know in the end that nothing would change the nature of God, that God is love. He cares about you. He is our friend in a very high place, but he's very close. Amen. So if there's anything you're going through today, give it to him today. When we were worshiping earlier, there was a sense of peace in this place. When we were singing completely abandoned, I believe God wants us to abandon all worries, all fears, abandon this world in the sense of not living like the world. We have to live in it, but we don't have to live like it. But most of all, trusting him with our whole life. You want to see God work in your life? Let go and let him work. Surrender what you're carrying and holding on to. He's trying to take it. Trust him with it and let him work. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now. And there could be people in this room right now, you know, you know, apologetics, evangelism, not on the radar right now. But Lord, I thank you that during our worship, you were here and in this word, you are speaking. And Lord, in that vision to Paul is still a promise for us that you will be with us. I thank you, God, that you care for us, that you love us, that you saw Paul and you see us. And Lord, I pray that we would have the peace of your presence in our heart. Lord, we surrender these things that we're carrying, those things that we worry about, Lord, we surrender it to you. And we ask God for you to intervene and work. And for those people that we've had to wash our hands with and just give to you, God, would you work in a powerful supernatural way? And God, would you work in us, prepare us to be ready for those who are coming to you, for those whose eyes are opening, they're waking up from this, this deadness, uh, uh, from the sinful nature, and they're coming alive, and they're, and they're seeing the truth of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that we would be ready as the church to be like a Priscilla and Aquila, or to be like a Paul, to disciple them, to be like a Paulus's, Lord, and to be like the church. Lord, help us to be ready. God, I pray that we would find community where we can find much care and comfort. Or that we would foster and create community, Lord, so we can be there for each other. We are stronger together, Lord. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. I thank you, God, that you are here for us. I pray you bring comfort and peace to those who have carried and brought in burdens today. Lord, may they give it to you today. May we lay it at your feet. For where does our help come from? 
our helper, you, the maker of heaven and earth. That's where our help comes from. God, we look up, we look to you. We don't look at ourselves, we don't look at man. We look to you. Help us today. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. May you be glorified through this service, Lord, the next service, Lord, and may you be glorified by the way we live. Help us to love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.